West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Bonnie Willis Fulton County DA says not so fast with stopping the prosecution of Donald Trump in Georgia by the Georgia Court of Appeals. She has filed a motion to dismiss on its face the appeal right now to the Court of Appeals. She has filed it arguing that because the entire premise and basis for Donald Trump's appeal Appeal of Judge McAfee's, the trial judge's decision that she should not be disqualified from the case is based on his factual findings. And because those factual findings of that trial judge and all trial judges in Georgia and really in every other state have to be given tremendous deference by the appellate court, which cannot under Georgia law substitute their own findings, their own judgment for that of the trial judge. If you throw out all of the basis of the appeal for Donald Trump, which is based entirely on attacking the factual findings, Fawny Willis argues you can't attack the factual findings of appellate court. You know the law in Georgia. I'm I'm going to read to you from the motion and from the law. But she's instructing the Court of Appeals that they got it wrong. They should never have granted this appeal. That's why she framed it as a motion to dismiss an improvidently granted appeal. An improvidently granted means it should not have been done. It was done inappropriately and improperly by the appellate court. And she's arguing that since this particular appeal is entirely premised on the factual findings made and sifted through by the trier of fact, the trial judge, Judge McAfee, and since they can't substitute as an appellate bench, they can't act as a supra trial court to substitute their judgment for his, they cannot they cannot reverse the decision and they cannot grant the appeal and disqualify Phony Willis. So her argument is we don't have to wait around for the actual briefing of the appeal on the merits. We don't have to wait around to October for a potential oral argument or March of 2025 for a potential ruling. Dismiss the appeal now on procedural grounds because the very basis, the very linchpin, right, should be pulled out from under Donald Trump because you could never, under the circumstances here, you could never uh, undercut or undermine or reverse the factual findings made by the trial court judge. It would be, he has brought, that trial judge has broad discretion given to it by the appellate court all the way up to the Georgia Supreme Court. And And the appellate court cannot be, cannot be a super trial court and come up with its own reasoning, listening, or reviewing the record. 
And since they can't do that, they never can reach the fundamental legal arguments or the fundamental uh, legal uh, premise for the motion that Fawny Willis should be disqualified because she had some sort of financial interest in the uh, outcome of the case, that she had some sort of improper appearance of impropriety relationship with one of her underlings or somebody that worked with her on her prosecution team, or that she committed what Georgia calls forensic misconduct because she gave a speech at a black church on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend and made some references to the case. The trial judge already developed those facts, and Georgia law does not allow a redo by the appellate court. Let me read to you from the actual opinion so you know what's happening here. And if she's successful on this, which will be separately briefed by all the parties and heard by this same court of appeals, this three-judge panel of the court of appeals, or ultimately by an en banc, the entirety of the court of appeals, if she wins... This case is over and it gets returned to Judge McAfee with Fawny Willis, the newly elected or re-elected uh, or will be re-elected uh, uh, Georgia, thumbs up on that, Georgia Fulton County District Attorney. She will be presiding over, she will be prosecuting this case with Judge McAfee uh, as well. So here's where we are. We got a motion to appeal. This is what they say in their opening on page two. As both this court and the Supreme Court, meaning the Georgia Supreme Court, have repeatedly held, Georgia appellate courts will not disturb a trial court's factual findings on disputed issues outside of certain very rare circumstances. In other words, it has to be flatly incorrect, clearly erroneous. And there's no there is no argument in Trump's briefs and those of the other uh, co-conspirator defendants that appealed that he made a clearly erroneous statement of law finding of, I'm sorry, finding a fact. They're attacking the law. They don't like the outcome. But in order to get there, they got to attack the factual record developed. And there is what Fawny Willis tells the court and reminds the Court of Appeals they have to give great deference to the trial court level. Or as they say on page two, when a trial court makes determinations concerning matters of credibility or evidentiary weight of the evidence being presented, the testimony being presented, reviewing courts will not disturb those determinations unless unless they are flatly incorrect. They contrast that with conclusions of law. What they say is we that the appellate courts owe no deference to a trial court's application of law to the facts, but they owe substantial deference to the way in which the trial court assessed the credibility of witnesses and found the relevant facts. To that end, the tri- the appellate court must accept the factual findings of the trial court unless they are clearly erroneous and must view the evidentiary record in the light most favorable to the findings and judgment of the trial court. Again, we don't use the appellate court to do a do-over. And so that is the fundamental argument. You got facts and you got law. And if the facts have to be accepted as true, there's no way the appellate court could disturb and reverse the finding by Judge McAfee, the trial judge, that there was no inappropriate relationship, no inappropriate financial dealings, no financial, uh, no forensic misconduct, and no basis to disqualify Fawny Willis. And as it related to the relationship, they also said that the remedy that was created by Judge McAfee, which is that Phony Willis basically fire Nathan Wade, the person that worked with her on her prosecution team, to solve the appearance of impropriety well before any jury has been selected in the case, so there can't be any taint uh, to the jury, it was sufficient. Um, and then they go through in the uh, 17 pages that they filed in talking about how the judge sifted through the, um, the trial testimony you know, crediting the trial testimony of Fawny Willis ultimately and destroying the lead witness, if you recall, or I'll tell this audience now, the lead witness for Donald Trump and for Mike Roman and the others was Terrence Bradley, the star witness, somebody who used to apparently work with Nathan Wade, the lawyer Fawny Willis had a relationship with somewhere and who the lawyer, uh, Ashley Merchant for Mike Roman, argued was going to blow the lid wide open and tell the court on sworn testimony that 
the relationship between Fawny and Nathan Wade started much earlier than they had told the court that it did. In other words, that they had perjured themselves in front of the court, except after the, the judge, who's the only one that can make this determination and not the appellate court, after hearing the testimony of Terrence Bradley, this is what, this is how the brief puts it. Appellant star witness attorney Terrence Bradley was such an utter cipher of either credibility or useful information that the trial court felt compelled to discard his testimony in its entirety from the court. The court finds itself unable to place any stock in the testimony of Terrence Bradley. His inconsistencies, demeanor, and generally non-responsive answers left far too brittle a foundation upon which to build any conclusions. And that's the trial judge. And the appellate court is stuck with that particular uh, that particular set of findings. Um, they then go on to talk about, at the bottom of uh, page five, that this is another factual finding of the trial judge that, that the uh, Fulton County DA argues to the Court of Appeals can't be disturbed. And if it can't be disturbed and it has to be accepted as true, there is no proper grounds for appeal. And it should be dismissed as of right right now. This is what they say at the bottom of page five in their brief. And most importantly, even when the court, trial court, considered everything proffered, everything, uh, every piece of evidence that was introduced, and cast a critical critical eye at the testimony from the district attorney. In other words, you know, he he didn't go easy on, on Fawny Willis and her testimony. Uh, but even with that critical eye on her testimony, the court still found that appellants lacked support for claims of a material, personal, or financial stake in the present case, which is one of their major grounds that somehow Fawny Willis was benefiting from continuing to prosecute Donald Trump. And this is what the court said that they remind the appellate court. Simply put, the defendants have not presented sufficient evidence indicating that the expenses were not roughly divided evenly or that the district attorney was or currently remains greatly and pecuniarily interested in this prosecution. In other words, them going away, Fawny Willis, Nathan Wade, um, some sort of little holiday weekend in Napa Valley or wine tasting or going on a cruise, and, and he used maybe some of the money that he made from being a prosecutor, does doesn't mean she's financially interested in the case. Like, in other words, she's not prosecuting Donald Trump because she wants to sip wine with Nathan Wade in Napa Valley. Get it? But they go on. At the end, um, they basically say, uh, on page seven, appellants were even less successful with their suggestion that the district attorney might have initiated the case solely due to a personal interest interest, or that she might be improperly prolonging the case with the trial court finding that the record indicated precisely the opposite to be true. Again, a factual finding that Fawny Willis is telling the Court of Appeals they have to accept is true. And if they accept all of these facts as true as developed by Judge McAfee, there is no appeal. We don't have to get through the substantive arguments on appeal. We certainly don't have to wait until March of 2025 at the latest to figure out whether there's going to be a trial of Donald Trump in Georgia. And that's the argument. Um, and so finally, as to the forensic misconduct, they the uh, on page uh, 10, Fawny Willis says, the only argument for forensic misconduct, which is a term of art in Georgia, which has to do with things that the prosecutor does outside of the case itself that may indicate a bias or make an appearance of impropriety. And they said the only thing was some comments made at the church, but they said that the court already, the trial court already sifted through that evidence, listened to that testimony, listened to that argument, and made its factual findings, which are not clearly erroneous and should not be should not be disturbed and have to be given great deference under Georgia law. Um, this is what he, this is what the brief says. The motion says on page ten. As a factual matter, the trial court found that the district attorney's public comments concerned either the office's conviction rates, the charges in the indictment, the procedural posture of the case, the need for or importance of the investigation, or personal anecdotes. The only statements that the trial court examined in greater detail concerned a speech given by the district attorney on January 14, 2024. That's the Martin Luther King Jr. speech at the Black Church. The trial court concluded that the speech did not cross the line because it failed to name any defendant, it did not disclose sensitive or confidential evidence, and it did not address the merits of the indicted offenses to move the trial to the court of public opinion. With these findings as to the speech, 
as well as the district attorney's testimony, the appellants cannot supply this court with any factual basis for reversal. And for these grounds, this is the last page, page 12, uh, for the above reasons, the state of Georgia submits this honorable court should grant this motion to dismiss the interlocutory appeal as improvidently granted. Now, what's going to happen next? Let's talk about that. There's going to be an opposing brief filed by um, Donald Trump's side and about six or seven other co-conspirators who have also appealed. Um, uh, there's going to be a briefing schedule that's going to be set by the clerk of the Court of Appeals. Uh, and then there's going to be potentially oral argument. There's going to be one more brief, sorry, by the prosecutors. They get the final say. And then there's going to be on this briefing schedule, potentially oral argument. Either that or the Court of Appeals without oral argument, but on the papers, is either going to grant this or deny it. If they deny it, it's another ability for Fawny Willis to seek immediate appeal by permission to the Georgia Supreme Court. So she'll be busy litigating this thing at the Georgia Supreme Court. In the meantime, the underlying appeal of Donald Trump is actually the one that's stopped in its tracks, while Fawny Willis fights over this procedural issue, which is very important. If she wins at the Court of Appeals level, based on oral argument, or she wins at the Georgia Supreme Court, then this appeal gets dismissed right now without any other further argument and the case gets returned to Judge McAfee and she stays on as the prosecutor and this was a very smart very uh, a very uh, uh, very uh, well strategic developed attack to the appeal yes if she loses on this she'll have to argue the merits of the appeal but right now this is a great shortcut it makes perfect sense i mean it was staring her right in the face she had to bring this motion but when you have a motion that's so when you have an appeal like donald trump's that's so heavily dependent on a factual record that has to be accepted as true you have to bring a motion like this so kudos and chef's kiss top top of the hat tip of the hat <laughs> to Fawny Willis and her appellate team at, in Fulton County. It is Friday, the 14th of June of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the little Yorkie is resting at the moment, and uh, so we will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Yes, we are. Well, our little Yorkie Precious is back from Dr. Dickey here in town, and uh, we will not have the test results for cancer. Yeah. Uh, for another week or so, but the treatment that they have her for the presumption it could be steroidal meningitis, meaning that it's meningitis that can be uh, treated with steroids, has made her, um, well, a little better. Uh, she's also, I have to pick up, I'm going to get the liquid uh, medium for prednisone, and uh, that'll also help with some of the pain is to lessen the inflammation and that will help a lot more with her just getting around she uh been walking like uh well dr dickie said it was like a drunken sailor and that's exactly what was happening the poor little thing the the inflammation was swelling and or has swollen and pushing on the nerves and She's having neurological issues. She couldn't feel where she was stepping. and so. But that inflammation must have decreased somewhat because she was walking a lot better. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, Dr. Dickey said that steroids will sometimes, uh, you know, decrease a tumor. So... And I forgot to ask him, did you see a tumor on the x-ray? And that's why... Oh, God. Well, regardless, the uh, pathologist that he was consulting with is the one that suggested that we get the test for cancer just to rule it out. <sighs> but it's still, you know, we'll find out. But right now she seems to be doing much better. Uh, she's eating. 
she will be drinking a lot more because of the prednisone. And then the results of that is, you know what? So get a few pads down. If I'm not around, I immediately get to her. I have pretty much decided, well, I have it actually. I still have until Monday to decide if I'm going to take her with me. Uh, neighbors will look after Gunner and uh, some of the gardening tasks around here. I got some things on auto and backwash from uh, some of the sprayers gets some, you know, uh, important plants like my tomatoes. Yeah, we say tomato. And uh, but I need to get my basil watered and where it is at is in a good spot if we have like exceedingly hot days because I want to be burned to a crisp <sighs> because they're in direct sunlight. Even they, even though it says direct sunlight, I found basil and tomatoes like pretty much like shade if they're going to be in a lot of heat. So they need some shade. Filtered sun is what I call it. Yeah. But uh, I could move the basil so that it got a little bit of backwash from the sprayers as well. But we'll see. Nonetheless, I have neighbors looking after Gunner, but I don't want anybody looking after Precious and having to split a pill in two, even if I was splitting them. Put it in some wet dog food on your finger and put it in her mouth, because that's what I got to do. I got, uh, what's it called here? Let's see. Yeah, it is called Mar Marbaquin. Some people will know what we're talking about here. Dog lovers. And uh, pick up the prednisone a little bit later this morning <clears throat> and give that to her. But I'm not going to put that task upon any of my neighbors. And I have considered and have the possibility of being able to border at the vets. Um. But then I was wondering if I want to put that task on anybody else that's there and ban them to do it, which would probably be kind of a wash between what I spend to bring her with me. Because there's, you know, oh, you got like a little like six pound Yorkie? <laughs> Pay up. Okay, boy, I'm glad I'm not bringing the 80 pound bulldog from England. Phew. When he moves, he's a tank, too, and he moves fast. But this little thing, yeah, that was... See, this is where I can tell she's feeling a little bit better because she's got her oats back. Um, the dogs think that it's great exercise to run around the yard, and it's a big corner lot, so they got a lot of exercise to do. While more uh, mannered dogs are, are having a walk, actually... Uh, uh, dog uh, owners, dog parents, what do you call them? I don't know. Uh, who are able to walk their dog on a leash. I was at one time able to walk Gunner for a considerable distance on a leash around the neighborhood, but I am unable to do that now. Because of, well, some mechanical issues, meaning my legs are shot. Ankles, knees. So they got they got the yard. We you know they get to exercise there, but re, nonetheless, uh, that's their sort of exercise. And uh, really, little precious is not supposed to be running around. And uh, that was one of the things Doctor Dickey and I had discussed: is that sometimes dogs won't do things in their best interest. Sound familiar? That's right. That's why it's so easy to call men dogs. Anyway, this little thing decided that since Gunner was going to run, you know, up the length of the yard, that uh, she would do it as well while uh, vocalizing. Uh, like G Gunner has his way of vocalizing, but it's a little bit different because he's an English bulldog. It's a little, you know, more huffy. But she, you know, she's piercing because she's a terror terrier. No, she's not. She's precious. Anyway, uh, I had to remind her that you shouldn't be running. <laughs> but she was actually able to run. So the uh, 
the treatment that she's getting for whatever it is that she's got. I guess it, if it's meningitis, I mean, just think of that. Meningitis. That's, that's a killer. Mm-hmm. So it brought her uh, temperature down. Oh, that was the other thing is that her temperature was normal and she seems to be doing pretty well. And she is. It, so, so she's actually right now resting and we're going to let her do that. She got up when I got up uh, earlier this morning and uh, looked around and went straight back and curled up and went back to sleep. Good for her. So, uh, oh, that was the other thing. She was able to climb a step. It's not a large step, you know, enough for a little dog to get up. And uh, she wasn't able to do that previously because her back legs just wouldn't work correctly because of the inflammation. But before I could get to her, she just climbed the step. I mean, pushed off, off her back legs and went up the step. So, if you think I'm a proud papa, yes, I am. And somewhat relieved, but we still got to get the test back from, oh, yeah, it goes to Memphis because it is a hub for jets and they overnight it. And they usually, when they do these things, they can get results right away. But this is one of these, well, special kinds. Thanks a lot. Because what they're doing is they're looking for a particular clone protein, and if it's a particular one, then that means that there's a cancer there. Thanks, oh, yeah. clones. Okay, well, what do we have in store for you here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? As I suddenly realize, I better remind folks one more time. And we'll have a small reminder at the end of the show. But all next week... I will be out of town. I'll hopefully get back. Well, I'm hoping to get back on uh, Thursday late. So I may rest control from of the station from our robot friend who I before artificial intelligence. And this is not artificial intelligence as far as I know. But uh, we could turn the station into a robot station just because of the ability to do automated uh, formatting. And it takes a little bit of work to do that. But uh, I sometimes just like to format, as I call it, handcrafted, meaning that we do it. But I can queue and schedule things and plot them in. And uh, so I will be doing some of that over the weekend so that we have a melange of regular, irregular, and uh, programming from Netroots Radio. And uh, so that's how we'll do it. Okay, regular mixed in with the irregular. And we'll have all of the live national feeds as usual. And David will be in his spot as usual. Now, the only caveat, and I woke up in a start last night thinking about this, is that where the mothership resides, when we were a kid, we used to call it the boonies. But I live in town, so I'm not truly in the boonies. But this town is in the boonies, meaning that we're prone to things like power outages. So I'm hoping that doesn't occur because I would still need someone to push a button to get the station back going. Yeah. Now, I suppose, I don't know. I think I actually, actually, I think I what I need to do because of security issues is have someone put in the passcode so it starts the software. But then they still need to push a button on the broadcaster to actually get everything rolling once again. Okay. So, the very least, I suppose, since people have camera phones, we can FaceTime. Uh, back in the day, we, uh, we had a remote way of actually manipulating each other's computers. And uh, so that 
I could use one device to manipulate the the mothership device. And it would let me actually move the cursor around and push the buttons. It was a little bit too clunky to format, but I could do actual, you know, pushing a button. <laughs> and, I'll, and actually quite a bit more. But uh, I'm trying to remember, I think that company went out of business or something. And uh, we just didn't want to open it up to something that was a little less secure to, you know, just anybody out in the world going, oh, well, we're just going to come in here and take over the Nutroots Radio Broadcaster. No, you're not. But nonetheless, uh, if there's any glitches or gaffes, we apologize ahead of time because I'm out of town and we are doing the celebration of life for my mom. And uh, my dad is down there as well. So, and he's, uh, you know, he's happy, but he's, uh, he's pretty old too, 96. So not many more visits and I don't want to miss any that I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be having. So, uh, so that stated, I uh, apologize for not being here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy next week, but there'll be something in this hour. Okay, I haven't quite decided what. If we're going to start the PB channel early or uh, we'll see. Okay, like I said, we're going to have a melange of regular and irregular Netroots radio programming. So we have enough to draw on, on to do that. Alrighty, what do we have in store for you today, though? As we end the week on this fabulous Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Hey, Fanny Willis, she knows how to clap back, especially with, I don't know. I don't know. Good old boy Southern Hospitality uh, Judicial BS. Yeah. Look, all she's saying is that you're the appellate court. You can't. You can't investigate this crime that you say that you're looking at an appeal for. You know, Donald Trump, how does this guy get all the deference in the world? Is it because the Russians have dirt on people? You know, I keep trying to remind folks, when Russia hacked the DNC, they hacked the RNC, but they didn't release the RNC publicly. What did they do? They went to each RNC member and said, you know, we've been uh, giving you money through the NRA, and this is our spy, Maria Butina. And uh, I'm sure there were others. And I'm sure there are others. And uh, so it's the only plausible explanation. How is it that just all of a sudden this guy? Of all the con men in the world, and all the con men bars in the world, this guy has to show up in ours. How is that? <sighs> okay. Anyway, on the rest of the menu, <laughs> good for Fanny Willis. I'm sorry, good for Fanny Willis for kicking their butts. We'll see how that works. On the rest of the menu, educational material from Propaganda Chop Shop Prager U is now taught in public schools in six states. And they they expect to be doing it more, and I expect to uh, give them some pushback, and we better. Top executives of a California-based online mental health company were arrested in a $100 million scheme to improperly prescribe Adderall during the pandemic and therefore decreasing the supply to people who really needed it. And a MAGA attorney, I'm sorry, sometimes I have to do the editorializing. Can you tell? A MAGA attorney charged in connection with an effort to illegally access and tamper with voting machines in Michigan after the 2020 election said that he is running for the state's high court. Well, that's one way of making sure you can make the law to make your crime legal. I guess that's one way. 
After the break, we move to the chef's table where the leader of Armenia declared his intention to pull out of a Russia-dominated security alliance as tensions rise between the two allies. And unseasonably extreme heat forced Greek authorities to shut down the Acropolis during the afternoon hours for the second day in a row. Just don't call it climate change. Don't. (laughs) Do. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Again, and we're going to forego the usuals as we usually have lately and uh, tuck into this first offering. But I just want to give a nod. I did have to lift my head and get it out of the bubble that we surround ourselves with here in the broadcast booth of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy and uh, notice that the Supreme Court had overturned the ban on bump stocks. So, you know, if, if you want to. If you want to assure that, uh, you know, you can run on American carnage when there really isn't any, you just give the MAGA people who have been hoarding all the guns for quite a while now. Just make it so that they can alter all those guns so that they fire each one 800 rounds a minute. Yeah, it'll be Las Vegas every day now. Oh, I'm going to go get a little uh, toy at the mall, Mom. Okay, son, don't be, we'll see you later. And uh, then you see on the news that somebody shot up the mall with 800 rounds a minute, and they had like a bunch of guns, and each one could shoot 800 rounds a minute. And there's a lot of minutes in minutes. 800 rounds for one minute from one gun. And I just have to say, it's all part of this wacko gambit that they want to destroy the administrative state. And because the ATF was the agency that did it. Now, of course, the ATF was tasked by Congress to do exactly that. And yet this Magus Godus says, no, it only has to be Congress. Well, they already gave them the task to do it. No, they're just, they're bureaucrats. All right. We know where this is going. And we don't have to like it. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, speakeasy as we truly begin on this fabulous Blue Moon Spirits Fridays is out of the Washington Post. I know it is now a truly magnetized Washington Post. But regardless, there's still some pretty good uh, journalists there. Uh, So anyway, but Hannah Natanson and Laura Meckler bring us this first offering. A privately funded effort to use disputed videos to teach conservative values in public schools is gaining traction. As Louisiana recently became the sixth state to endorse educational materials produced by Prager University. Prager U is not a university, but a nonprofit that produces short videos that push patriotism and conservative views of history, race, sex, and gender, among other topics. <sighs> you know, we could just 
condense all that. And, you know, because I like the idea of concise and precise language. Prager you lies. Back to the article. Since last year, Florida, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, Montana, and Arizona have also announced partnerships with Prager U, under which the nonprofit's lessons become state sanctioned optional teaching materials for public schools. Meaning that if they're optional, each school can say they are mandatory. See how that works? Prager U is neither paying nor receiving money from state partners, the nonprofit and state officials said, because why do they need it? They got Harlan Crow, the Navasses, the Petersons. Etc., 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 helping fund their efforts to pretty much undermine America from within with their fascist lies. In this reporter's opinion, back to the article. The company and its supporters hail the moves as countering what they call left leaning ideas in education. You know, like due process and protection for all. Equality is a sin to Prager U because that teaches, I don't know, woke commie values. Give me a break. Opponents say materials produced by Prager U amount to right wing indoctrination. No shit, Sherlock. Prager U, founded in 2009 by conservative talk show host Dennis Prager, who I should remind folks pushed the swift boat lie. And screenwriter Alan Estrin began producing videos aimed at college students and expanded its offerings in 2021 to reach younger students. Its website says its goal is to counter the dominant left-wing ideology and culture, media, and education by promoting American values. Sounds like that weird Opus Day BS. Two of the most watched videos on Prager U Kids YouTube channel are a lesson on Student Loans 101 and a cartoon style retelling of the biblical story of David and Goliath that instructs children when God is on your side, you have nothing to fear. Okay. Some of Prager U's videos have drawn criticism for factual inaccuracies, especially for a fictionalized animated clip that portrays famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass defending the nation's founding father's support of slavery. Yeah, well, uh, officials at uh, Prager U dispute that their materials are inaccurate. They say the nonprofit is providing a patriotic viewpoint missing from public schools nationwide. American students are basically given a very one-sided perspective of American history and civics, they said. We don't teach that America is perfect, but we teach that America is the greatest experiment on planet Earth. Well, you know what? I grew up with that liberal, woke, commie education, and that's exactly what we were taught. Just not all the lies. Supporters of PragerU partnerships note that teachers are not being required to deploy the materials. Deploy? It's like a war to them, you know. They say the introduction of PragerU to public school classrooms is a much-needed course correction after years in which schools adopted implicitly or explicitly left-leaning lessons based on materials like the New York Times 1619 Project, which positioned slavery at the heart of the nation's founding. So I guess it's woke leftist indoctrination that taught us that we had to make concessions with the southern states to make human beings three-fifths of a human so they could be enslaved to be, well, drivers of an economic engine that could not have existed otherwise unless they enslaved human beings.
Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Top executives of a California-based online mental health company were arrested on allegations of improperly prescribing addictive stimulants like Adderall during the coronavirus pandemic and exacerbating the shortage of the drugs for those who medically needed them. Ruthia Hay, the founder and CEO of Dunn Global Inc. and clinical president David Brody were arrested yesterday, Thursday in Los Angeles and San Rafael, California, respectively. They uh, for conspiring to provide easy access to Adderall and other stimulant drugs that which are largely used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD in exchange for a monthly subscription fee, the U.S. Justice Department announced. Dunn Global helped prescribe more than 40 million pills of Adderall and other stimulants and earned over $100 million in revenue. us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. An attorney charged in connection with an effort to illegally access and tamper with voting machines in Michigan after the 2020 election said that he is running for the state's high court. Republican Matthew DiPerno, a supporter of Trump, made the announcement on the social platform we all know know as Twitter. DiPerno, who lost in a 2022 bid for Michigan Attorney General, was arraigned last summer on undue possession of a voting machine and conspiracy charges. Dare Rendon, a former Republican state representative, was charged with conspiracy to commit undue possession of a voting machine and false pretenses. Five vote tabulators were illegally taken from three Michigan counties and brought to a hotel room, according to documents released by the Michigan Attorney General, Dana Nessel's office. Well, that takes us to our break and we better do it it's going to be a short one just so i can cough and clear my throat so uh, when we get back from that break we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today you are listening to west coast cookbook and speakeasy and we will be right back you are listening to networksradio.com please hang up and try again From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. Amendment 6, a repeal of Florida's public funding of elections option, faces voters on November 5th. Such small donor matching systems help candidates outside the political machine structure to compete and can help limit special interest influence. Voters passed a 1998 constitutional amendment creating a method of public financing for campaigns for statewide office and affirmed it again in 2010. Gubernatorial candidates must raise $150,000 in $250 amounts, which the state matches 2 to 1 or 1 to 1 above the threshold. 
The matching threshold for cabinet candidates is $100,000. Taking public money also requires adherence to spending limits, which in 2022 were over $30.28 million for governor and lieutenant governor, about $2 per registered voter. For attorney general and other cabinet offices, the cost was about $1 per voter. The Miami Herald reports that since 2010, $33 million in matching campaign funding has been spent. Amy Keith of Common Cause Florida said in a March statement, Let's be clear, seeking to repeal laws that address this issue of special interests and big campaign donors is a step backwards. It silences the voices of everyday Floridians and gives favor to the wealthy to corrupt our politics. Find out more at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the diner of life. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently... 55 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs only around 75 to 78, and uh, pretty much of a cooling trend in those temperature ranges through the weekend, even through Monday and Tuesday of next week. And then we'll be in the low 80s for the rest of the week, so we'll see about how that works, and I won't be in town. But it looks like we're much cooler than we were at this time last year. Partly cloudy throughout the day. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. A few clouds overnight with lows in the upper 40s. Winds out of the northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. So wind will have picked up. Partly cloudy skies in the morning. Saturday will give way to cloudy skies during the afternoon with highs in the low 70s. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Those are chilly temperatures for us, not for you. Grass pollen is rated very high here in Rogue River. The air quality index is in the good range at 22 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is very high at level 9. So slather on that SPF. Just do it. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.19 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is down to 48% and falling. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that is the Weather Underground. London is 66 degrees and mostly cloudy. Paris is 72 and mostly cloudy with a thunderstorm advisory. And I always remind folks, if you've never been in a thunderstorm in Paris, you don't know what a thunderstorm is. Oh my God. Scary. Rome is 81 and sunny. Kabul is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 82 and clear. Tokyo is 74 and clear. Auckland, New Zealand is 55 and mostly cloudy with wind. San Francisco, California is 58 degrees and sunny with a small craft advisory on the bay and offshore. Chicago, Illinois is 80 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 82 degrees Fahrenheit, sunny with a smog alert. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Bet the 
Morian of the Associated Press World Desk brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. The leader of Armenia declared his intention to pull out of a Russia dominated security alliance of several ex Soviet nations as tensions rise between the, the two allies. Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan said his government will decide later when to leave the Collective Security Treaty Organization, or CSTO, a grouping that includes Russia and the former Soviet Central Asian nations of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Amid the widening rift with Russia, Armenia earlier froze its participation in the alliance, canceled its involvement in joint military drills, and snubbed CSTO uh, summits. Pashinian said on Wednesday for the first time that Armenia will leave the alliance altogether. He spoke during a question and answer session in Parliament, saying that the Government will decide later when to make the final move. Shortly after, in an apparent attempt to soften the blow to Moscow, Armenia's foreign minister, Ararat Mazurian, emphasized that Pashinian hadn't announced the full withdrawal yet. Those who assert the prime minister said that Armenia is withdrawing from the CSTO are mistaken, Mazurian said. There was no immediate comment from Moscow. Well, yeah. Armenia's ties with Russia, its longtime sponsor and ally, have grown increasingly strained after Azerbaijan waged a lightning military campaign in September, you know, like a blitzkrieg, to take the Karabakh region, ending three decades of ethnic Armenian separatist rule there. Armenian authorities accused Russian peacekeepers, oh, you mean like little green men? who were deployed to Nagorno-Karabakh after the previous round of hostilities in 2020, of failing to stop Azerbaijan's onslaught. Moscow, which has a military base in Armenia, rejected the accusations, arguing that its troops did not have a mandate to intervene. at the World Jask of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Authorities in Greece closed down the Acropolis in Athens during the afternoon on Thursday yesterday for the second day as the country swelters un- under unseasonably high temperatures. The culture ministry said the hilltop citadel, which is Greece's most popular ancient site, was closed from midday to 5 p.m. local time because of the heat. All other archaeological sites in the Greek capital were also shut during the same hours. People who had booked visits for that period could use their tickets later in the day until the sites closed at 8 p.m., the ministry said. Temperatures exceeded 104 degrees Fahrenheit yesterday, Thursday, in much of central and southern Greece, including greater Athens, the Cyclades, and Crete. Officials are on heightened alert for wildfires, which plague Greece every summer. The minister responsible for civil protection, Vasilis Gakilius, said uh, that said Thursday posed a particular wildfire risk due to a combination of high temperatures and winds. The fire service also warned of a very 
high wildfire threat today, Friday. Authorities in Athens are providing air-conditioned areas to the public and have issued fans to secondary schools where end-of-year and university entrance exams are being held. Okay, well, we started through that one. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and for the week. But you do know that Roots Radio broadcasts on, and we will be meeting up here on Monday the 24th here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy right here. But do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day, all night, and all next week for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here on the 24th. That's right. Right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver